I've got 2.30 Eastern time at least here at home. So we will get started and we'll welcome others as they join us. First, I just want to thank Chris Sharp for being here this afternoon for this second session of the day for the pre-conference for making the most of Evergreen Reports. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment from the organizing committee to say a big thank you to our sponsors and the conference sponsor for the entire conference, I should say. We want to thank the Evergreen Community Development Initiative for being the platform sponsor. We want to thank Mobius for being our captioning sponsor. And I will put a link into the chat for the captioning so you can watch that live for those of you that may want to do that. And also our pre-conference sponsor for today for all of the pre-conference sessions is COOL, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries. And I know we have representatives from COOL here with us this afternoon. So thanks to all of you. I also want to remind folks that only the speaker will have audio and video uh, enabled to be shared. So if you have questions, please put those in the chat box and we'll make sure we're monitoring that throughout the afternoon. Um, if you um, are having trouble getting in, you can hear my voice, but you can't see anything, please just put a note there. I'll be monitoring that as well. This session is being recorded. In fact, it's being recorded already. Everything that Chris is showing now, um, his slides will be shared after the conference as well to go along with the, the recording. So thank you all for being here. And with that said, I will turn everything over to Chris. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm always curious uh, when I start these things because I see a lot of, uh, a lot of familiar looking names here. I, I would say faces if we were in the same room, but uh, let me know in the chat, if you will, um kind of what your experience is with evergreen reports is this your first time doing a session like this are you a trainer are you an end user and i just sort of want to get an idea of, of who i'm talking to today and of course you know there are 53 currently uh people that i can see and uh counted here in the chat so uh, you know but feel free if, if you're willing to speak up and just sort of let me know kind of what your uh, wh what brings you to the report session and like, what's your experience with it? Yeah, so St Stuart is a repeat, uh, a repeater. We have, you know, there are lots of people in the Pines libraries that come get kind of training after training every time there is something to do. And Chris, I created a poll a simple yes or no if you've been to a oh, conversation on reports with you oh, before today that's very handy thank you mm -hmm. all right so we've got some new users we've got people who have done this before in the past people who want to learn more yeah okay yeah uh, Dari said what I hear a lot of the time is people who've been using Evergreen a long time, but reports just never make sense. And there's some people there. So there's Bradley who knows SQL. And we'll talk about SQL. Great. I have at least 10 folks that have never seen a report session with you before. So you have a okay. few newbies. Great. Great. Well, um, I, that, that gives me a great idea. I really appreciate it. It looks like we have a range of experiences and a range of um, interests here. Uh, so <clears throat> it, is, it is a good idea to sort of have an idea of what you want out of the session. Um, and that helps me uh, sort of tailor what's going on. Because, um, you know, a lot of, I've, as others who've seen this before can tell you, it, it's more or less the same presentation but I, I, I do like to cater or you know tailor it so that it can um, we, we can get it so so it's actually useful to everybody um, now before we get started with the um, with this uh, with the actual presentation I did want to mention I gave a link which I'll drop in again since there's been a lot of chat since. Uh, to this document that you can see on my screen here that looks really tiny to you. Um, but this is sort of the overview of what we'll be doing today. Um, the, uh, 
there is a link here on the second page that is to my test server that is running current evergreen master uh, and i have the list of logins here so if you want to use a, a server that's not a production server to just sort of mess around and play with the reports it's just using the um, test data set that we use in the development community but it you know you can create simple reports to do circulation or holds or you know you know how many bibs you have etc it's just not there's not a whole lot of stuff in there um, the other thing that I've added to this over the years and this is you know kind of a, a growing document with every session you know it sort of gave you some some basic paths from within the reporter to things that you probably need a lot for items and circulations and things like that. Um, and that can be added to. But I also this morning decided that it would be a good idea to add just a whole bunch of reports um, schemas basically. So you can follow these paths. You know, Pines uses particular um, views that may not be available to everybody, but I did want to at least lay these out as an example of reports that we have found useful. This is basically a list of our, um, our what we call our quick reports, and that's something that we use internally. It was developed by Emerald Data Networks for us, um, and um, you know I know there was some interest in it a few years ago in the community, but I'm not sure anybody outside of Pines adopted it. But uh, that has, just having a, whether you're using quick reports or not, having a, a set of sort of canned reports that you can just create and then, you know, let staff use. I mean, this captures probably, I don't know, 90% of the actual needs that we have uh, for reports. So, so hopefully this will be useful for you to have this kind of stuff. It, it's a, a broad range of, um, of areas here. And I just sort of dumped them in this document. They may, they're not in a particular order uh, except by the report name. So, um, and I, I can redo this if that, if there is a better way to organize these, um, by topic or whatever. So anyway, so just know that this, this is available to you. I, I, I keep this document public and, um, you know, like I said, I just, I've, I've added to it over the years and it's basically the same session. So I am a person who does believe that, um, that repetition is good. Uh, for, for this sort of thing because it, it's it's hard to learn and if there's not a, a way to uh, you know if, if you learn it in one session and then you just sort of go back to work and get back to whatever you were doing and never use it then you don't really get to learn it and um, so anyway so we're, we're gonna go through um, we're gonna start basics um, I, I find that sort of walking people up to the complex is a little better than diving into the scary interface at the second we uh, get started so let's take a look at my super awesome presentation here so we're gonna present okay so I uh, I've been doing reports since around 2011 uh, when a staff member left us who had sort of been the reports guru. And um, I, I took that over uh, kind of reluctantly. I didn't really want to do it. I wasn't very interested in it, but I was interested in SQL. And SQL is a database language that allows you to write by hand queries to the database to get information. <laughs> a 10 year reports anniversary, yes. Um, that's right. And it was around April. So I, I guess it is over now, over 10 years. Um, but I, um, I learned how to use the interface because I had learned the database first. And that's, a, that's like no one else except a developer probably would have that, you know, or a system administrator would sort of have that view in the first place. Um, but it made, the once I understood the way the database is laid out, the interface for reports clicked for me and I, it made sense to me. If you're coming from the outside looking in, it's just mind boggling. So, um, but ever since then, I've sort of been the person that our consortium turns to, to um, create reports templates from scratch or, or things like that. And of course every, you know, we do have the, our sort of canned reports that I just showed you, but we, we you know, there's always a, a, a little special snowflake report that, uh, <laughs> that a library needs that we have to sort of make. And some some of them are are not just, um, you know, this report 
needs to be exactly what I want rather than us um, using what's there. Some of them are needs that are just very complex. So we, you know, we do have that sort of thing. Um, let's see, which is which for me is easier to just do that than trying to help staff with reports. Yes, that's right. Um, so I am, um, I guess we'll just start at the beginning. So I try to start with a place where people, um, people know, yeah, I mean, we all live in a, an Excel world. If you work in libraries at all, you've used a spreadsheet you know, just because that's an easy way to do it. And the reason it's easy and understandable is that there are rows and columns and it lets you put things in, you know, you can label each field, you know, here can be, um, you know, title, author, whatever. You can just put these in these columns and then the values are underneath, things like that. Um, and <clears throat> spreadsheets are great. And I won't walk through the entire thing that I do sometimes where, you know, we sort of pretend like we're starting a business, you know, selling snow tires or whatever. Um, but this is not really an effective way to run a business or a library or something like that because it's only two dimensional. It's only, you know, column A, column B, et cetera. And you end up with a lot of repeating information and it doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing is databases take, um, the, way, the way that databases work backing some sort of software program is that you take a real object, like I have this glass of tea here, and you, if a database wanted to describe what this glass of tea is, you'd have to have certain Attributes and attributes is this the the term that we use a lot in in reports and and in databases and in um, if, you, if you're a cataloger you know attributes and it sounds like we do have several tech services cataloging people here um, so they'll know this so we take real life objects like books and money and people and places and make them into something that a, that software can understand, that a database can understand. And so to do that, we take a book. And so in the chat, it, why don't you tell me what are some attributes of this book? <laughs> that That is usually correct logic, Bradley. But um, in my case, I gave up sugar and tea a while back. So I am an unsweet tea drinker. But when I go to other parts of the country and say I want unsweet tea, they look at me funny. So, so number of pages, size, pages, subject, type of cover, pagination, there's a cataloger, pagination, size, subject matter, columns. Okay, so you've got some of this. It's interesting because when, when you ask catalogers, they'll say pagination, size, subject matter. If you ask a... CERC person, you get title and author and maybe, you know, pub year. It's it's just, you know, two two different views of the same thing. So yeah, yeah. So this like we think of it as a book and we recognize that we don't have to think any further. We know what a book is, but we need to tell the database what a book is. We need to tell the database what attributes we need to record for the book, what sort of metadata that we need to record for the book. So you have the title and the author, and you've got the actual and then the pagination and everything else of the edition and all that sort of stuff. And then you have the holdings for each book and this is a you know, cataloging term holdings. So you have a, a, a place where in, in the computer you are seeing, this is the item in my hand. It is an instance of this bibliographic record sitting here. So, all right, so what about a person? What are some, um, attributes of a patron, age, name, height. I don't know if we record height. Uh, name and address, yes, good, right? Whether they are a resident, like where they live, exactly. Their contact information. Right, okay, well, let's keep going. Password, okay, yep. 
All right, and then there are things in Evergreen that we have to keep track of that are not real. Like you can hold a book in your hand, you can see a person, you can be inside a building, but you can't see a circulation and you can't touch a circulation and you can't touch a hold or a hold transit. You know, yes, the, the book is going on a truck somewhere, but that is not a thing, that is an action. And you have to sort of figure out where you're going to store that kind of stuff. But what are some what are some attributes of a circulation? Like when we think of a circulation, what what are some things that we need to to keep track of? So a checkout date, right? How long are they getting to keep it? So due date, right? The user who is checking out the book, exactly. That is a that is a key point. Some of these things you you think of as being obvious, yes, the item, right? Right? Length, location, date, transit holds, yes. Sometimes right. So circulations can earn fines if the person doesn't return it. The, the place where it happened, Ruth, Ruth, you you named something this important too. So the circulation is I guess the best way to think of it is it's a relationship between the person who's standing there, the building where this is happening, the item that they are checking out, the time where it, when it happened, and how long they get to keep it, and possibly any bills that then result from them not returning it back or losing it or whatever. So circulation sort of ties a bunch of that stuff together um, in a way that starts to give you a clue about what the database needs to know. It needs to know who's this person, what's this book, where did it happen, who's the staff member who's sitting there, who's, you know, holding the book and checking it out to this young girl, who is that? You know, there are things like that. Let's see, I'm going to look at Jeremy. Let's see. Yes, it sounds like Jeremy is a system administrator who knows what cron is. And um, that is, yes. So yes, I do the same thing. Sometimes you create a, a straight up query that um, will um, be easier than doing it in the reports interface. Do I have a chart of all that's involved in the circulation? Not exactly. I mean, I've, I've done this. So, okay, I will tell you also. So if, if for what, if by some amazing uh, happening, we end up seeing each other in person again someday, I do this with a whiteboard, and I guess I could have gotten fancy and had a whiteboard behind me here, but I, I'm just not that fancy. Um, and I will dry, draw charts and have that. It's a little hard to do on a screen like this. I've tried it before and it just didn't work well for me and it wasn't very natural. So yes, I understand. I'm a, I'm a visual guy too, and I like to see that. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so someday you'll see me with a whiteboard. Just come find me and I'll, I'll draw it on a sheet of paper for you. <laughs> but yes, ha having a chart, actually drawing this out yourself might be a useful thought exercise. Okay, so, you know, I mentioned that, you know, with the database, it has to keep this information in different places inside the database so that it's not just repeating itself over and over again. So... When you think of a book, you're thinking of one thing that's a book, but we the database has to think of that as several layers. So you have the actual item copy, the call number slash volume, and that's something that if you're not a cataloger and you're just not that familiar with the, the guts of Evergreen might be a little confusing, but in Evergreen, the, the, the call number is actually considered a thing and it's sort of a holding unit, I guess you could say, that all the copies get attached to, and that volume in turn is attached to the actual BIP record. And that's so catalogers understand that intuitively because they work with it every day, but if you're if you're not a cataloger, that might sound a little weird. Um, you also, so you have the bibliographic record. The bibliographic record itself contains a whole bunch of metadata, but it's, it's really quote unquote expensive for the database to be looking things up in the bibliographic record every single time you do a search. So it's more efficient that you pull that data out into its own schema 
And then when you do searches, you're searching those tables and not, you know, the entire bib record and trying to find, you know, the, the, the little text string you're looking for. The circulations that are associated with a book are related, the hold requests on the book. These are not the actual table names. Um, the books go into transit. They are sometimes on hold when they go into transits. Um, where the book belongs inside the library, the circulation modifier, that's an optional piece of metadata that we use in Pines, but um, gives, gives you sort of a, an item type, which library owns the item, which library circulates the item. That's often the same thing, but not always. And then the user who created the item or edited the item last, and then there are statistical categories. So you, you get an idea, like this is just a book. So that one book you see there behind all these words, all of this stuff plus more is required to describe that at the database level. So why am I telling you all this? I am telling you all this because to create a report, you're taking a bunch of disparate data that is kind of spread out among tables and you have to figure out a way in a report to gather that data back together into something that is coherent for you to use to report to your manager or report to your director or to your report to a board or at a public meeting or a legislator or someone like that. So while this sounds really arcane, this is vital to our jobs and our existence as libraries. We have to be able to report things. We have to be able to get this data back out and have it in a usable way. So your job learning here in this session is to learn what is behind reports and what, what how reports are actually being created in the background. So, um, Let's see, let me see something here. Boom, ba -da boom, ba -da boom. All right. Um, let's do a quick poll and I'll keep talking, but um, Jennifer, you were able to create a poll a minute ago. If you can figure out how many people use SQL or are familiar with SQL, however you want to phrase the question. Sure. And then, and then people, if y'all will just, uh, you know, let me know if you've heard of this. Some people will have and some people won't. And I'll keep I'll keep talking while while you answer that poll. So SQL is um, sometimes considered to mean oh yeah, Rogan, ha ah, um, is considered to mean um, structured query language or something like that. But I you know it, SQL is sometimes how that's pronounced. I say SQL, I also say tomato, and you may say tomato. Um, it doesn't really matter what you call it. I know that like people say MySQL a lot of the time, but no one says PostgreSQL unless they don't know that it's considered PostgreSQL. So there, you know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what that does is it gives you a human, oh, squirrel, I like that. Um, it gives you a human readable, human writable, understandable way to create, to, to interact with the database. So there are things you can do with, let's see, I've got to figure out what my slide does here. Yeah, okay, we'll get to that in a second. So one of them, you can insert data, you can update data, you can delete data. You can um, do lots, you can copy things. Anyway, there are lots of things you can do with, with, with SQL slash SQL. And one of them is select. And select doesn't change anything. It's just like you are reading what's there. Okay, go out and get me this stuff that I now wanna see. That's what a select query does. Um, so select whatever it is you wanna see. And in this case, this will be columns that we put together from different tables. Most of the time, it's not just in one table. From your chosen data sources, meaning that you once you learn the database schema, which you don't have to do, but you have to learn where it is in the reporter, you can put those together, choose where you're getting your data from, and then you 
join that probably on other tables. Um, I didn't talk about keys yet, but we can get to that. And then where those filter conditions are met. So basically you're saying, you know, select title from, this is fake, so don't, you know, we'll, we'll get to real queries, but let's say select title from bibliographic record where the owner is my library and the author is this, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. That That's an example of the sort of thing you're creating. Um, the reason that I think it's important to understand the select query is that is the basis of the user interface. So when you're looking at the user interface, you're like, oh God, what is all this stuff? The way it works, okay, that's another type of, of um, filter. Okay, so the way it works is you've got select is basically what fields do I want to see? And that's display fields in the new interface, displayed fields in the old Zool client from table. So that would be your source. Where am I getting my data from? Source. And then where is your filters? So selecting data from tables, where are filters? Okay. And so why are, well, let's get to that in a little bit. And then, you know, having is another type of filter, which I don't think is important to get into right now. Let's see, I think that is the end of my presentation. Uh, any questions so far? Let's see how you did on my poll. Okay, about about half and half. That's that's not bad. Okay, well you'll you'll just learn a little bit to do it. I will say um, before we go any further that the W three schools. Um, well, I'll just search it. So w3schools.com has tutorials, and one of them is going to be um, SQL. So you can just walk through this, and it will teach you the basics of, of SQL slash SQL. Um, and it teaches you all the joins and all the stuff that we care about, but we're not going to be um, we're not we're not going to be digging into all of the different permutations because uh, this is only a two-hour session, basically. <laughs> um, all right. Um, okay, so let's move on. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Let's move on to the interface itself. So again, I'm using my C Sharp master server. You are welcome to use it. I'm gonna increase my size here. That's a little better, right? Okay, uh, we'll see if that blows the reporter. If you if you make your screen too big, I'm sure you've noticed it will just start destroying the design. So I, I'm, I'm gonna try to keep that from happening. Okay, so to get to the reporter, um, there's this reports link from the front. There's also under administration, there's also reports. Um, so I'm going to click there. Okay. If, once you once you get to this area, now first of all, I, I will say that you need to be, um, you actually need to have permission to do reports. So the the users that I have on my document here, and I'll increase that too. Um, the users I have here are people, these are like global and system administrators, and the reason I chose those only are those are the ones that can run reports. Uh, if you're like sort of a run-of-the-mill CERC person or a cataloger, generally you have to be granted specifically as an individual those, those permissions, um, or you just have to ask your system administrator to run the report for you. Often, because I am a system administrator, you know that your system administrator wants you to do it yourself. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're always willing to help, at least I am. I'll speak for myself, not everybody. Okay, so right now I'm logged in as one of the local administrators. Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, as long as you have perms. So I, y you will see this interface, and already you're in some trouble because 
you have this templates, reports, output, templates, reports, output. Ah, I don't know what this is. So let's let's walk through it. Um, you see this my folders area. Those are, you know, my folders. Um, the, the whole my and your thing uh, with computers is kind of, uh, that, that's been a big argument the whole time. So what is a template? Somebody tell me, oh, somebody's saying they're only seeing my opening title screen. Is that still true? Maybe it's just a window. Let me see if I can change. I thought it was showing my whole screen. Okay, okay, good. Okay, great, great. Yeah, I think, I mean, when I'm, yeah, okay, that, that's what I'm expecting to see is, is that, yeah, all right. Okay, so Catherine, are you able to see it now? Okay, it says, you say okay, all right. Okay, so there's this my folders area, shared folders area. So who can tell me templates? Like what is a template in general? Like what is a template? Not necessarily a reports template. Describe something an outline of what you want to see happen, a starter setup to plug info into, a wrapper around a construct, a wrapper around a query I said, uh, I meant uh, prefabricated construct. Exactly, a guide, yes. You can think of it as a form, okay? Now, the trick is that you have, in Evergreen Reports, unless somebody's done this for you, you have to, well, that's the only way to get attention, Benjamin, as you shout. So, the only, um, <clears throat> unless somebody's done it for you, you have to create the template yourself. And that probably is the hurdle that we're talking about today getting over, because if somebody had done this for you, you just use reports and you wouldn't need a reports training. But, so there's templates here, and, and so that's what, I, that's what templates means here, is that you have created a form for yourself or for someone else to plug in data, run the report and it will be consistent every time. And just like Elaine said, you have the same, same elements in a form every time you use that form, exactly. And catalogers know about templates too, and Elaine is definitely a cataloger. Um, reports here, you're like, well, wait, I just clicked reports, what's reports mean here? Well, reports is where you take a template and then you put the data in the template. That has to be saved somewhere. So this is where it's saved in this reports area, okay? And then finally, there's output. And output, of course, is the report results, okay? So that's what we're dealing with. Shared folders is where other people's stuff that you have access to see, which is, it just depends on how your library is set up as to who, which ones you can see and who gets to share, but that's where they show up for other people. So when you start this interface, if you've done nothing here, like I have, you're gonna see these little sheet of paper icons. And those are actually folders, which is a little confusing, but okay, so we're gonna click on templates. I am going to create a folder. I'm gonna just share it. I'll share it with my system and I'll create a subfolder. And it says action succeeded. Okay, and now that changed to what is a folder icon, okay? You can't do anything until you have a folder to put this stuff in, it won't let you. So reports, I'll do the same thing. Note that it kept my same name and settings. Well, actually it didn't keep my system. And I will share it. And I will do the same thing here. That's interesting. You see how it tripled, anyway. Hey, bugs. This whole interface is due for a redesign. I think everybody knows that. Okay, create subfolder, da, 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 da. Okay, so now these have become folders. And if you already had folders here, you now have these arrows pointing at the folder. And those arrows are clickable. So if you click on the arrow, it will turn green, turn down, and then you will see this 
new sheet of paper icon again representing a folder not a sheet of paper but this is the this is the folder where you're actually going to work from and if you expand all of your templates and reports those are all available so let me see i'm going to refresh for a second i'll see if anybody had shared a folder yet you should see mine if you're part of my system if you're on if you're on my my computer um, if you're on my server so um okay so once you are in here you can't do anything with reports or output yet because you have you don't have any templates to run yet so i'm clicking on my template for folder that i just created and then you have this part of the interface you have two options here you can manage your folder contents which is the default or you can manage the folder. Hey, I want to change the name of my folder, or I want to not share it anymore, or I want to put a, you know, create a subfolder, which you can do, and you can get super organized. It is a good idea to, to be organized. But I will say, like this, um, what I usually do is I'll have a folder called Chris or C Sharp or something like that. This just my playground. I don't ever want anybody to see this folder. Normally, I would not be sharing the C-sharp folder. I have my own folder that I mess around with. It's a sandbox. I can do whatever I want to. I can junk it up as much as I want to. But then you have shared folders that you then, you're, you're publishing your report. You are creating a report that you are then sharing with other people. Uh, you don't want everybody using the same junk, that you, you know, because you have to experiment with this stuff. It's not, it's not necessarily easy. Okay, so um, you have these options here in this drop down. You can create a new report. You can clone a report, which we'll talk about later. If, if you know a template's not working for you or whatever, you can delete it or no longer useful. Also, you can move to a different folder. So you could create another folder and then move this to another folder. Um, and then, you know, if there were any templates here already, it would be showing them. But what, we're, what I'm going to click next is create a new template for this folder. Okay, so this is a little too big. I'm going to have to make it a little smaller until I see what I need to see. So sorry for, for that. You might be able to expand your screen a little bit to make it bigger. Or look at your own screen uh, if, you're, if you're following along somewhere. Um, so this is the scary interface that nobody likes. And we're going to make this work. Um, you'll see at the top there's template name, so you can say my first template if you want. Um, there is a description here, so a meaningful description. In real life, a useful thing to put in description would be something similar to those Pines reports definitions that I output in that document that I shared. So that's that's an example. The kind of stuff I do, I sort of do a, a breadcrumbs style way to go from the source that I've picked all the way to the column that we're gonna be showing or fil filtering on, okay? The other thing you can do is create a documentation URL. In this case, I'm just gonna use the Evergreen website just for an example. Okay, this saves when we're done, but we're not ready yet. So you'll see this, there are three panes here in the middle. And one says core source, and one says, and nullability, and we're not gonna worry about nullability today. That's just a little too, too deep to get into, I think. Um, these will then get populated when we start doing things here. You'll see the select source dropdown. I'm not gonna click it yet. And then down at the bottom, there is a display fields, which I showed you on the little document earlier in the presentation. And then there's a filters. If you click this, it will make that tab active and you'll see that these column names changed. Okay, so this is the basic interface. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go, like we click this and it has this drop down with a lot of stuff that is gonna look a little arcane and scary and I don't want you to feel like it is, okay? The top section of this dropdown are called core sources. And then the rest are, well, non-core sources. But like if you keep going down, 
you will just see lots of things you've never heard of and don't really know what they are. Um, all of these names, and there are a bunch at the end called undefined, which always uh, makes me a little nervous about what those actually are. Um, all of those map to either tables in the database or some sort of construct that then itself leads to an actual table in the database. Um, there is an inter intervening layer of software that sort of in between the database and what we're, what we're seeing here called the field mapper um, that has all these names in there and tells you what the fields are, it defines all this stuff. This is incidentally, the field mapper is where if you were to create a table in the database, if you're a system administrator, if you create a table in the database that you would then want the, the reporter to know about and be able to run reports on for end users, you would add the table, add the mappings to the field mapper, and then it would show up in this list. So that 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 is a, a, a cool feature and something to do, but that's a different training and a different session. Um, You'll see things called like, you know, classic this, that, and the other. Um, and a lot of these by default aren't hooked up, which is not ideal. There's a bug open on this and we've gone back and forth inside the bug um, <laughs> where, um, you know, some of us want to remove this part and others want us to add the part that this is not hooked up to, et cetera. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track. What we're going to pick is item out of course horse. Okay, we're going to pick item. Okay, item is the same thing as copy. Uh, in fact, it is called copy at the database level. And so what I did when I clicked item, it now has this little arrow pointing at item. And that might be a little bit confusing at first. But now that that's selected, I can click on the word item. I'm not clicking on the, the uh, arrow yet. I'm going to click the word item. And then kaboom, this middle section populates with some data. OK? What do you all think this is? What is? What are these? What's this list of stuff? Fields, attributes, available data types, fields in the item table. Yes, it is the fields in the item table um, as defined by the field mapper. So, so we have these fields, and Benjamin said a key, key term is data type. There are different types of data that we store in the database, and if um, and it does matter what they are depending it's the reporter treats them differently depending on what they are you'll see some with what looks like maybe a car battery but is actually a calendar um, and that is a timestamp you'll see this little chain looking thing here and i'll talk about that in a second as to what that actually means. You'll see the letter, the Roman letter A, and that means it's text. So that's, you know, there's that means that the type of data that belongs here is text. It's not a number, it's not a date, it's text. Um, this little check mark indicates that it's a Boolean field, and Boolean for, for uh, Postgres is really just true and false. If you're a uh, symbolic uh, logic person, then you know that Boolean can get super, super, super complicated more than true and false. But in this case, it's just true or false. You'll see a little pine tree here under circulating library. That means organizational unit, and that's something we'll talk about as well in a little more detail. So a couple more of those chain looking things. And then a little what looks like a UPC barcode on the back of a book, but that's not the barcode, that's the ID. The barcode, incidentally, is text, so have fun with that. Um, and then we have a dollar sign, which, you know, that's money, right? And money in Evergreen really just means uh, that it's a decimal point um, here. And let's see, then there's this little scale looking thing. That's what that's supposed to be, but that's like the fine level. And, you know, I think that's just a, not sure what, 
maybe that's a number, maybe that's integer. I bet that's it, it's, that's what that means is integer. We should have some pop-ups that show you what that is. That would be helpful. Okay, so the chain things are what are called links. And we talked about at the beginning how you have to, for a database to work, it has to sort of explode all the data into a bunch of different tables. And that our job as report as reports creators is to gather all of that information back up and put it together. And the way we put it together is we link one table to another. And underneath it all, it's being linked by ID numbers. And if you're an SQL person, you would call the ID from the table where you are, in this case, item slash copy, that ID is called the primary key. And another table's primary key is called a foreign key. And so what these links are, are where another table's primary key is located. Now, I, I, I'm probably losing you, but let I think, it'll become clear when we expand item. So remember, I just clicked on the text item and it populated this. Now we're gonna click on the arrow that expands this, okay? So one thing you can see right away is there's a whole bunch of new stuff under here and that's scary to everyone who has never used reports before. But what we can see here is that there's age hold protection here and hey, look, there's one of those link symbols. The chain symbol is right here for age hold protection. Let's say I'm gonna look at call number volume. There's a link here. Hey, call number volumes right over here. And circulation modifier. Hey, circulation modifier is right over here. Circulation type, circulation types right over here. Are we seeing a pattern yet? What these are is the point in the item table where these link out to other tables, okay? So all of these are linked sources. You can think of them as sources or tables to the item table. And you'll see that they also have arrows. So don't click those yet. But just, just as an example, I'll click on call number volume. I'll click on the words, okay? And then the middle section here changed. So yeah, I'll get to that, Jeremy. Um, so now we have a different set of data. So what is this? So we have item and call number slash volume is linked to item. And these are the fields available to us from call number volume. So for instance, if we were trying to do a book, which is why I chose item, because we know books, right? The call number, if you look down this list, it's not really text, it's gonna be a number because that link is not text. So if you clicked on this and thought that you were gonna report out a volume or, or an actual call number, it wouldn't be a call number, it'd be like 823134 or something like that. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense to you. But we can go to the linked table call number volume and there we will find the call number label, which is what we're actually after, okay? So the arrow beside each of these things means that you can then expand those and get to these other linked tables. And then you can expand and expand and expand and expand and expand and it'll let you do it forever, but don't. Um, the reason you don't want to do that is the further you go down, it's creating linkages to linkages to linkages to linkages and then you end up with like this weird Russian doll style report that doesn't make any sense. It, it like it will take forever and you've lost all the efficiency that you get by using the reporter. Okay, so did that answer your question, Jeremy? Is everybody with me? I'm open to questions, by the way. There's a Q&A feature, but there's also just in the chat, if y'all are following me, then that's great. I'll assume no news is good news, so you do need to speak up if you have an issue. All right, so um, what are we gonna do here? So why don't we do a report 
of let's do a shelf list that's probably the simplest thing we can do so you've got your your circ staff is at the front desk and they're just you know they're 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 scrolling instagram so you know they're not busy and you want to give them something to do so we need to create an item list that we would then hand them to um hand hand them a list that they can go you know do some shelf checks or some weeding or something like that, right? So we're just gonna do a shelf list, very simple report. Um, yes, Keith, it it goes forever and you can test it if you want to, but I think we all have better things to do. <laughs> all right, so what are the things we want to see on a shelf list? You don't have to look at the, the list of available fields. You can just tell me what you think. You wanna see a title, a call number, item status. You wanna see an author, barcode. Yes, you wanna know that you've got the right copy, so you need a barcode. Yep, circ modifier would be optional probably. It depends on what you're, what you're making the shelf list for. The number of circs, like if this is a weeding report, we would definitely want to know how many circs. Um, this is gonna be a pretty simple shelf list. This is just sort of as a proof of concept to show you how reports work. All right, so I think we've got some fields here. And I think Linda may have given us a uh, nice summary there. Uh, you know, comprehensive. Oh, right, where it falls in career rankings. We're not gonna get into career right now. We did, we have, we've uh, in Pines created some reports that do crew stuff, but anyway. Okay, so uh let's start what i like to do is i like to figure out where the item is physically which is what you know one important thing so who owns the item um i'm going to expand this and the circulating library is where that item actually lives like that's the where it is on the shelf so we are going to pick circulating library and we are going to look at, we want to see the name. Let's do the short name. We call this in, in, in Pines, we call it the Pines code, but you might call it something similar. Sort of the policy code, the short name, whatever you want to call it. So we're gonna, so what I did is I clicked on circulating library. I clicked on short policy name, and then I'm going to click add fields. And what that did is that put it down here. Now I haven't talked about the transform column yet and I know that I haven't, I don't get back to it. Um, so this is gonna show us, this is, this is a display field. So this is what's gonna be on the report. The other thing to know is the order you put them in is the order they're gonna be sorted by, if that makes sense. Um, so we want the owning library, you know, the circulating library. We also want to know where in the library it is. So we probably want the shelving location. Now again, I'm, I'm on item and I've expanded item. So I click item and expand it. And it has all these places to get other things. Shelving location is such a place. So I'm gonna click shelving location. And then we have these columns here in the middle. And I am going to click name. Okay. So, so far we, so, we show the circulating library and the shelving location, but these column labels, I think we already have a problem here because it just says short policy name, which is not gonna mean anything to your bored Instagram scrolling circ person. So why don't we change this? And the way we change it is we select this and you can right click and you can say change column label, comes up with a pop-up, and then we say circ library or whatever you wanna, whatever you wanna say. I'll hit that again. Okay, so now, now it says circ library. Is circulating library owning library? Well, you've hit an interesting question. Probably in most cases, yes. Um, the reason that there is an owning library, which is an attribute of the call number object, the volume object, 
is that the idea was that you can be a library system that owns an item but maybe you change where it circulates, but you still own it. And I guess the best example of this would be like a, a bookmobile maybe, where you, or, or like a temporary shelving collection or some temporary shelving area that's, that's considered a different unit, like a subunit. So you can be the, I, I always pick on Athens because I went to the University of Georgia and that's, you know, it's just a city that's dear to my heart. So the Athens Regional Library might have this item. It puts it on the bookmobile. Well, the bookmobile doesn't own the item. Athens owns the item. The bookmobile is where it's shelved right now because that's where we put it. So that's the idea behind a shelving, like a, um, circulating library versus an owning library. So the circulating library is on the item and the owning library is on the volume. And if that doesn't make sense to you, go grab your nearest cataloger and let them explain because they know all about it. So I also don't like that shelving location just says name. That's pretty not good. So let's change that one also. And I will say shelving location, okay. Okay, continue. And now that's together. Now the other thing to know, and this is why you know I talked about using the, descript the description for the little breadcrumbs thing, is while this is telling us where we got this information, there's nothing that's obvious where, what this actually is. Where did that come from? What is Circ Library? You're just gonna see Circ Library. You're not gonna see, um, Oh, not, not all catalogers will understand why that is. Yes, you're correct, Elaine, as, as you know, I know. Um, you don't know where these came from because you've changed the name, but that's why you need those sort of breadcrumb style documentation. And maybe, maybe when the reports interface is redone, it can maybe sort of auto document itself because the type of breadcrumb stuff I do is not complicated. It's just, where did I click? It seems like something could keep track of that. Okay, circulation, circ library, shelving location. Now, from my point of view, I, I really wish we were in a room together. This is so much better in a room. But anyway, I would want to see the call number on the report next. So we can locate it on the shelf. So I'm going to click call number label, add fields. Again, call number label is not my favorite way of saying that because nobody says that. They say call number. So I'm just changing it to call number. And then we want title oops where's title okay now we get a good lesson as to why reports can be complicated but hopefully this will teach you where these things are probably 85 percent of the reports we've ever created are some variant of an item list this is important if you start with the item source so item call number volume I'm gonna expand call number volume. There's bib records. So now we're getting a little closer to where the title is going to be located, okay? We are now going to expand bib record though. The bib record itself has the title. So like I clicked on bib record, these are the actual fields on bib record, but it's not gonna be that useful because what it's gonna be is Mark 21 Slim, which you know you don't want. And a cataloger doesn't have to explain that to you probably. It's just gonna be a big blob of XML. You don't want that. So what you do want is a title, the simple, and fortunately under bib record, and again, I've gone item, I've expanded call number volume, and I've expanded bib record. And under bib record is a section called simple record extracts. I'm not gonna click the arrow beside it. I'm gonna click the word. And now that's highlighted. And these are those fields. And hey, look, familiar things. Okay, you know what these are. You may not know what fingerprint is, but you're going to know the rest of them probably. So we're going to do the title is here. And hey, look, the author is here too. We're going to go ahead and grab that. Now notice that I clicked it, clicked title first, then author. And I'll just put, because you know it's useful for a cataloger to have this later if, say, they can't find this. I'll click TCN value, okay? So that puts the TCN on the report. Now I clicked one, two, three in that order and I'm gonna click add fields. Hey, look, they're in that order and added them all at once. 
Okay, so there's another UI feature, uh, user interface feature, is you can click multiple fields and you can click put them in the, the you click them in the order you want them to appear here. But let's say if we wanted TCN to appear before author, you can do a right click on that field and click move field up. We don't yet have a drag and drop. That would be a nice thing. I'm, but I don't want it there. I'm gonna click move field down. Um, if you want to unclick one of these, you can do that. And that'll unselect it, okay? Um, now, so far, we're just doing all of this is text. That's the only data type we're dealing with yet. So we're doing, um, so we've got circle library, shelving location, call number, title pro proper, author, TCN value, and we said barcode, right? So I'm gonna go back to item, and I'm going to click barcode, and I'm gonna say add fields. Now, again, I'm gonna clean up some of these column labels because I just don't love them. That's optional. A lot of libraries just leave them the way it is, but I think reports are complicated enough without confusing language here at the top. Okay, so that's a nice clean set of column labels. We can deal with that. So am I ready to roll? If I ran this report right now, what would happen? Was there a remove in that dropdown? Yes, so if I, if I decided, oops, I made a mistake, you can click remove field and it'll take it out. Yes, Bradley's right. If I ran it right now, it'd be all the items. It wouldn't matter if they were deleted or undeleted or whatever. You get everything, okay? Now, when you're using the small test data on the on a test server like this one, that's no big deal. But if you're in Pines and you have, you know, I don't know, 15 million items or so that are living in the database, including deleted ones, you don't want that. It's definitely not what you want. So we need to, well, filter our results, right? So that's my really clever segue to getting into our next topic, which is filters. We now what we we now know what we want to see, and I'm going to click filter. Okay, we're on filters now. Everything at the top stays the same. We're still picking fields from the top. It's the same thing. So. We want to just limit this to the library we're in. And we do have an is deleted flag, yes. So we're gonna start with item. Might as well do that first, thanks Ruth. So is deleted is one of the things we want. And I'll just go ahead and add that down here. Now, right now, if we leave this as is, all right, I, I need to back up slightly. So, Source path tells us where this came from. It tells us the name of the field. The column is what the database calls it or the or the field mapper calls it. The data type, we talked about Boolean, Boolean, not Boolean. Um, the operator is e equals and transform is, is something we'll talk about in a second because uh, we're gonna have to figure out a transform, what that means. So operator, is a little like your operators in math. So there's gonna be equals and things like that. So we're gonna change operator. Well, sorry, I'm gonna back up. If you leave this as it is without a value, it, operator's fine, it, there's no value. If you leave it without a value, the person who runs this report is gonna to have to select whether they want deleted items or not deleted items every time they run the report. That's gonna confuse the holy mother out of whoever is trying to run this report. So we are going to change the filter value and it lets us choose true or false. So this is also like head spinning logic, huh? Deleted true versus deleted false. So deleted true means it has been deleted. Deleted false means it has not been deleted. We want things that have not been deleted. I'm gonna click false. Does that make sense or did I lose you? Sometimes I'm listening to myself and I feel like I'm talking double talk. Okay. Um, so we have to set that, and that's what I call hard coding this. And, and you know, basically you, you just go ahead and you hard code that this is, we're never gonna care about deleted items. 
In fact, most of the time, nobody cares about deleted items except for catalogers, and they want to, you know, run a how, these, these are the items I deleted this month report or something like that. But like Circ staff doing a shelf check, they don't care whether it, you know, old books are on that report that no longer exists. That doesn't doesn't make sense. Okay, so the next thing, so if we ran this report right now, what would it be? It'd still be everything, but it'd be everything that was not deleted. So things things that are, you know, supposedly on the shelf in the entire library system, right? All the things. So we need to limit this to where the library is, right? So let's we, we chose circulating library, so let's be consistent. We'll choose circulating library again. And this time we're gonna click this organizational unit ID with that weird pine tree symbol thing. So we're gonna click that and then we're gonna add the field. Okay, that means organizational unit, and it even says so down here, the data type is org unit. Well, that's not a data type. If you went on the, the PostgreSQL manual, it's not gonna tell you that there's a org unit data type. That is a specific to evergreen thing. And what it does is it gives you a little bit of what I like to call magic. And it what it will do, um, is it will let you, it'll give you with equals or with in list, it will give you a nice selectable list of the libraries that you want to pick from. And we'll see that in action in a minute. Okay, we're going to change this operator from equals to in list. This goes a little bit away from the, um, the model that you know, you're just going to hand this to your staff member who's sitting at your desk in your library, but this lets you run a shelf list for multiple libraries if you want to. Okay. All right. So now we can select the library where this is. And so if we run it now, it will show all non deleted items at the, the libraries we select on the list. So fewer of the things, but still probably not what we want. It's still a lot. You know, any even small libraries, that's going to be thousands of items probably. So what we, we need to limit it further. I think a good candidate for that is the shelving location, since that's sort of what we're after as a shelf list. So we're going to click shelving location. And we don't, we're creating a filter now. So, hmm. Do we want to have to remember the name of every single shelving location? I think we don't. We would rather have a nice selectable list of the shelving locations in the library. So what we'll do is we will not pick name where we have to remember that stuff. We're gonna pick the weird barcode looking thing called location ID. So ID, I'm gonna click that and click add fields. ID acts a little like org unit where it creates the nice selectable list if possible. Um, and that list is not only nice and selectable, it is contextualized to where your library is logged in. So like I am logged in at BR1, okay? So when I run this report from a BR1 workstation like I am right now, it's gonna look at, it's gonna give you a list of BR1's locations. This is another um, good thing about having consistently named shelving locations across <laughs> across your libraries. Um, oh, you know what? That's not true. It'll still go by ID. But anyway, we're, we're, we're worried about one library now. Um, so again, we want to list we want to be able to pick more than one because they might need to, <clears throat> this person's been on Instagram all day, so they may, may need more to do. So we're gonna change operator to in list and not just equals. Equals will just give you one, in list will let you select multiple. Okay, so now we're gonna get non-deleted items at library whatever you choose, in shelving location whatever you choose. So Taryn, that's something I hate because I don't want to have to log into a branch workstation in order to get their shelving location list. Yes, if you administer a consortium like we do at Pines, it is frustrating because as a matter of course, we're just logged into our own unit 
And if you try to run a report at another library that's contextualized like this, it throws you off. But for probably most end users who aren't administering multiple libraries, this is perfect. It does what they need to do. Like our friend Scott Brock here, who I'm logged in as. Okay, so we are going to, we've got a report. We're going to see circle library, shelving location, call number, title, author, TCN, and barcode. We've got our filter set up to delete it, and that's hard coded, so we don't have to select that every time. We show our circulating library in a list and our shelving location in a list. I think we're ready to roll. We've put in our template name, our template description with our amazing documentation that we've been creating the whole time. And then we've got our documentation URL. So I'm going to save the template and it's gonna pop up and say, you wanna do that? And I say, yes. And at the bottom, you, you probably missed it, but there was a little green box that said template success, successfully saved. And then it kicks you back to this starter screen, okay? So I'm gonna find the folder where I put it. That's some, you know, if you're a messy person, you have a million folders, that might be a challenge. This is why it's consistent to sort of work in a, um, in a sandbox folder that's always the same. Well, where did I put it? Hello? Why didn't that work? Um, you saw that it worked, right? That's very interesting. All right, nope, start. Well, see live demos. Live demos will always kill you. Okay, let's take a quick break. I'll try to get my stuff together here and fix this. And that'll give you a chance to stretch. To stretch. Uh, it's been about an hour and 10 minutes since we started this session. If we can come back in about 10 minutes, that would be great. Have a nice break.
I have changed servers. Oh, I'm glad this is helpful for you. Let's see, where did that go? Okay, no, wrong one. Here we go. <clears throat> Okie dokie. I'll give folks another minute to come back, although probably already bit basically here. All right, so I did change servers to one that I know works. I, I, I did double check in the template we slaved so hard on did not get saved. So I have created the same template on a Pines test server that has all of our, the junk. So these are the junky folders that I was talking about. So my Chris folder is just full of many, many, many experiments. <clears throat> Some failed, etc. Okay, so we're going to run this report. So you run a report by finding it on the list and you click the box beside it. And then you say, create a new report from the selected template. I'm gonna click Submit. Yes, I try to be verbose in the descriptions because um, I wanna know what I did. And honestly, that has never failed me. I can always recreate what I did if I do that. So uh, my first report. Okay, and this is this is a real library's real data as far as like their um, uh, their items go. We won't be doing patron data for that reason uh, on this server. <clears throat> okay, let's see. So a very useful description okay now the stuff you type in here is going to get seen by um, whoever you share your reports output link with so that's just something to know so if you get cute or insulting or whatever <laughs> just know that somebody else might see it sometime I, I try to keep in mind that my boss might see this that my you know the public might see this so you know just be careful so I am going to, this, <clears throat> this interface is the re running reports. Um, we have the template name, the creator, who is me, the description, which I've put a very useful description. Um, I'm gonna put a little parenthetical thing so we can distinguish the useful description from the other useful description. Um, it shows you the reports columns we're going to be seeing and then it says choose a sh choose a folder to store this report definition and remember I told you what reports are in here this reports on this side I'm going to make this slightly bigger there it's probably better for y'all um, over here in reports that's where that's that's kept so I'm going to pick the Chris folder to store that um, now you can see the nice selectable list I was talking about. Now these are all the Pines libraries. So on yours, it probably won't be that long, but you know, whatever. So I am in, this is, I'm pretending I am inside the Athens library. That's where the Instagram using staff member is. So I am going to add that. If I wanted to add other branches, I could. Um, but since they don't have these shelving locations by ID, that might not be as useful as you think. Okay, now, <clears throat> this has populated this list with the shelving locations available to this library, which means that that's why we're seeing, well, first of all, there are one, two, three blank ones. I don't know what those are. So take note, Elaine. And then we have like two adults, and there's no way to tell at this, in this situation, oh, I did equals and not end list. So I'm, I'm just, just bear with me. Just, if this were end list, you'd see the add and delete box there, but I'm, I'm not gonna worry about it. We're, we're not gonna send our Instagrammer to more than one section. Um, so you'll see several AV, AV, AV. We have no way to know which ones those are. But the reason you're seeing multiples is that this must mean that the Athens library has 
at the system level an AV um, shelving location, and then there's another shelving location that belongs to this library. That that must be what's going on now. For the third one, I'm not really sure. I don't think there's a Pines level one, but that's that's what it should be. And may this it's also possible that there is a, a trailing space or something after one of these, and that's why it's allowing it to be, they have to be named uniquely. Um, oh, and Elaine's saying I'm seeing deleted shelving locations. Okay, uh, I, I have not checked to see whether this cares about deleted. It would be nice if it did. And if it doesn't, actually, that's a bug. So her, good on you, Elaine, go report that bug. Okay, so we're gonna tell them to go weed the, or go do a shelf check of biography. We'll just, we'll be nice. That's not as big a section as like, um, as, um, you know, fiction or something like that. Uh, hopefully it won't be a terribly long list for us to do this with. So it, you can also see the filter that we hard coded and that is an F that may be difficult for you to see on the screen, but that is a letter F which stands for false, okay? Um, that's a good point, Taryn. This is the way we troubleshoot in Pines. We just find the problems with what the other person says. Okay, so output options. By default, it's going to uh, say to output it as Excel, and Excel can be also read by OpenOffice slash LibreOffice Calc um, or you know Google Docs or whatever. Uh, you can also do CSV output here, uh, comma separated values. That would be very useful for somebody who wants to upload this to a website or another database or something like that. Um, calculate grouping subtotals. That's a fairly recent feature that uses a built-in feature of PostgreSQL that we've, we haven't found particularly like, you know, mind-shatteringly useful, but it is, it is good. Um, and then we have HTML output, which is going to give you a big box on the screen that you can look at. I use that to just sort of see what it looks like. Um, also, Excel, you'll, you'll learn this if you work with Excel and Evergreen Reports a lot, that Excel by default strips out certain characters. So like if you have leading spaces or trailing spaces that actually exist in the database, you won't be able to find the, or even leading zeros. Um, you won't be able to see those in Excel. They, they just strip them out. So you, sometimes you can see them in the um, HTML output. Um, and then there's the charts, bar charts, line charts. Bar charts is done by default. I, you know, again, that's not been something that our libraries have found all that useful that I've ever heard, but they do exist. Okay, here's where we talk about how the report gets scheduled, okay? So, some of these you want every day, some of these you want every week on Monday or something like that. Um, that's what you have this option of recurring report and you just click that box and then you can pick the recurrence in an interval. It can be every week, every month, right? Every two weeks, every you know, 23 days I want a report. That uh, doesn't seem like a probably common thing to see. In this case, I actually don't want it to recur, but I will uncheck that. Uh, run as soon as possible, or you can pick a time. Now, the advantage of picking a time is that if you were going to choose a running report, let's let's say you've it's May 24th, right? It's nowhere near the beginning or the end of the month, but you want a report that comes on the first of the month. Well, how do you do that? How do you get it to to recur on the first of the month? Well, you you pick your recurring in interval. You say one month, and then you start it actually in the past. On May 1st and what that'll do and then at whatever time you pick and what that does is it puts it in the scheduler the scheduler uh, the report scheduler actually looks for the oldest report that can run that has not run yet and it will um, take it from there so you, you can schedule in the past and that will let you pick your date and your time otherwise what it will do is it will run at Monday, May 24th at 4.01 p.m. Every every month, it'll be the 24th at 4.01 p.m. And that's probably not what you want. So I'm gonna unclick recurring because I don't want it. Uh, run as soon as possible because we just, we just want this now. This is an ad hoc report. We wanna go give it to the Instagrammer and do this. Okay, 
the completion notification gets sent out by email. And if you have an email in your account, it will put it here. You can also add another, whoops, email. And I just did it with a space, but you can do commas or whatever. It's Perl, so it knows what it's doing. <laughs> I'm only typing badly because you're watching. Okay. And then you can, you can put as many as you want. Um, another thing is if you um, know you cannot do ASAP and recurring, but if you set the time, if you don't specify the time, it will just be the time right now. Um, yeah, it runs the first time right now, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Sorry, D, I, I'm, I'm getting turned around and, and even in my thinking about it. Okay, so with the emails that receive this, 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 is, this has very little to do with Evergreen itself, but if you are getting these sent to like a particular set of staff members or, you know, just, you know, Betty gets them right now, but Betty retires and then, you know, Annie has to get it next. Well, you know, it might be better to sort of have a reports at whatever your library's domain is instead of Betty at whatever your library's domain is. So you don't have to worry about that sort of jumping around thing that you always have to do when somebody leaves. Um, so you might just have a reports group and then send it to, you know, three different people who are part of the reports alias. Yes, Jeremy just said it, send aliases, exactly. It's good to have a Jeremy Miller around when you're working in a library. They can solve lots of the problems like this for efficiency. So if it's recurring, you can always, the report, you can always uh, edit the report. Yes, you can. And that, that was not always true. You used to have to just delete it and then start over. But yes, you can now edit reports. Okay, so then you're selecting your output folder. Again, I'm just gonna pick my junky Chris output folder for this. Okay, so we have put in our report name, our report description, we see the columns, we've chosen the uh, where, where it's gonna be stored in the Chris folder. We have picked ARL AF, which is the Athens uh, Regional Library Headquarters. We are choosing biography. Uh, it's going to be non-deleted items. We've chosen Excel. We don't need CSV. We're not going to worry about the grouping subtotals thing. We don't want it to recur. We're running it as soon as possible. We have added emails to send it to. I have picked the output folder. We're ready to roll. I am going to click save report. So when I save report, it pops up, action succeeded, and then it disappears. And then what happened? Hmm. You don't know. <laughs> at this point it's up to your server and how quickly it runs um, so but what you can do is check on it and it probably has come back by now actually um, so if you go to your output folder that you just chose you can click on that and it will show you what the status is and in this case this is under pending items and I'm wondering if reports are actually running so I may do a quick sysadmin task here. Bum -ba -dum -ba -dum. See, I told you there'd be black screens in code. Let's see. Uh, nope, it's not running. Okay, now it's running. Let's see what it does. Boom, ba -dum, boom, ba -dum, boom, ba -dum, boom, 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 boom. Oops. Cannot connect to server. Oh, I know why. That's why it's not working at all. Sorry, more sysadmin. Um, shoot. Live demos, guys. Live demos. Bear with me. Oh, you're right. That was the wrong theme song. 
tell, tell me which one to whistle or sing. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. No, I can't show you that. I had to move it off the screen for a second because I'm about to show you sensitive data. Sorry about that, guys. Now we might be in business, so forgive me. Oh, good. I'm glad people are actually running reports because I haven't been able to yet. <laughs> Apparently we have a queue of reports because this is taking a little bit. finished okay so um oh am i a reports genius i'm not sure i am uh let's see i think i just demonstrated that i'm not uh let's do so to view their output you click the box beside this you click view you make sure this shows view report output and you click submit the other thing that has also happened is that an email was just sent to me and Taryn with this um, with this same information same link here that gives us this reporter information um, and if you have the um, permission, which in Pines, all staff members can see reports, uh, you can, you know, if you give them a link, they can go to it. So it says that there are too many uh, rows to make a bar chart. The title of this is my first report. It is, a, there, it shows a very useful description of my report, right? So again, like I said, this is visible to anybody you share this link to. Um, and so I'm going to click tabular output. So that that's that HTML option. And this might be huge. Okay, so this is our list. So we now we this is the biography section at ARLF. This is out of this is actually from several months ago, but this shows you this information, and it shows all of the different uh, things you want to have on there. And so that person can go. We didn't put the status on there. Somebody mentioned that. That would have been good, because yeah, some of these are going to be checked out. We, we should have filtered by status. But again, you know, this is this is how you learn as you try things. Um, and you see, yeah, these are two different books. Sometimes you see things that look the same, but they are different with barcodes. So these are different copies. Okay, so there's that. Um, 
I'll also show you, you can click back to output index. It'll take you back here. You can download it as an Excel file. I'm on Linux and running um, LibreOffice. So it comes out in here and then I can do all the cool stuff you can do in Excel to, to make the list you know, bigger or whatever. I'm not gonna do it right now. Excel training is something that you should do if you don't know it. Okay, so the other thing I just clicked, there's that sort of pale blue button that says um, debugging info. And here is what the actual query that was run looks like. So it's this big blob of stuff and you can, but it is human readable. I mean, it's, it's showing you what the columns were and all that stuff. It shows you how the tables got joined together. So let's say that um, you run this report and you're like, well, wait a minute, that's missing like, lots of titles that I expected to see on the report, you would then um, get your Evergreen administrator who knows how to troubleshoot this kind of stuff and give them this, this stuff here. And then they could go in and say, huh, let's see the joins here. Oh, that's an inner join. That should be an outer join or something like that. And then you can figure it out. So this is stuff that is beyond the scope of this training to be able to get into deeply, but it is good to know that this is here and you might actually learn something through it. The other thing you can do, and I do this all the time to sort of make it look less crowded, is I'll go in and I will actually use a little find and replace in a text editor to get these long strings replaced with something like ACP or something like that to just sort of condense this and make it look, so I can understand which tables fields are doing what thing. There's a lot more on this screen than that that is useful to, to system administrators. Uh, it show, shows you which template, who owns the template, what folder the template was in, uh, the, the actual data for the template that, that was read by the um, reporter at the time it was run, the different parameters that are in there. All this stuff is useful to uh, administrators and probably not useful to you. But that top part is very good for troubleshooting. So yes, Ruth, this when I uh, this didn't always exist either. And when we finally had this feature, I was thrilled because before you had to go put, you had to basically create this yourself with like a Perl script that was on the server. And this is so much better to just have this here. Okay, so let's talk a little about reports and how scheduling works. Um, the reports behind the report runner is called Clark Kent.pl, which is you know hilarious. But he is your friendly neighborhood uh, reporter, and he is running in the background, um, waiting for trouble, is what what it says from the server side. And that process checks, I think, pretty much every second for new reports. Uh, the top of every second. And so it just does a query to the database. And what it's doing is it's looking for any report that is older than now, that is like the age we are right now, is there anything older than this and runs whatever's there. So that's why you can put in a date in the past and then, oh, you didn't understand the Clark reference until now. Um, you can put a date in the past and it will still run. So um, the, uh, depending on your system and how it's set up, it can run multiple reports at a time. In Pines, we have six slots, um, which we, at one point we had 12 slots uh, because we just had a, a reports backup and that, that really had more to do with hardware than the number of slots. And there is a diminishing returns. You're like, well, why not have 20 slots? Well, if you have 20 large, run, long running SQL queries on a single server that can suck up all the resources and, and cause trouble. And in fact, even if you have six, I mean, there's occasionally we'll get a super ambitious person out there in the libraries. It's like, oh, I'm going to weed all the things this month. So they would have liked that one with the few filters that we we're about to run, you know, but they'll run like six reports at one time. They'll just be like, bam, 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 bam. Well, what that's done is it's got reports that might run a while 
taking up all the slots, meaning that everybody's waiting for their reports to come back. And then they start sending us tickets saying, uh, I sent that report in an hour ago and it's not back yet. And it usually just takes a few seconds. So just, you know, it's sort of like, you know, any shared resource, you just have to be considerate uh, uh, of it. Um, but it, we also have ways to figure out if there are reports that are running overdue or, you know, reports, you know, you can, you can figure out a lot about who's running the report, all that stuff. There's some queries you can find that stuff out if you're, if you're the server administrator. Um, but there's not really a way to tell, like you can't see a progress bar or anything like that from the staff client side. And that can be kind of frustrating because you send it off and you're like, oh my God, the board's meet the board meetings in five minutes. You know, for one thing, don't do that. For another thing, it, it re there really isn't a way to know how fast it's gonna go. And um, so that that's something that you and your sysadmins will just have to negotiate. Um, now we only got to do kind of one report. I will I'll show you cloning just real quick since we can. Um, so to clone a report, you go back to where your report is located. Whoops, that's output. Uh, it's in my Chris folder, and the report I named it uh, simple, simple weed, simple shelving list. Okay, so I clicked that, and then instead of create new report, I'm going to click create or a clone, clone selected template, submit, and then it lets you pick the folder, the reports folder, where it's gonna be stored. Again, I'm just gonna pick Chris, and then select folder. And then it throws you back in this interface, but it's different because it's got fields populated. I'm gonna make this a little smaller again so we can see everything. Um, so it says simple shelving list, so it's got the same name except it says clone afterwards and if you cloned it again it'd say clone clone because it just adds clone to the end of whatever's there um, and that's because the report has to have a unique name um, again same description you know it is it has cloned the report it's copied the the report totally now you can clone this to just sort of save it meaning like, okay, this was somebody else's report that they shared in their shared folders, and I want my own copy. You could just save what's there and say, super cool, If they even if they move it away, I love this report and I want my own copy of it. So you can do that. Or you realize, oh, I forgot to add the status or whatever. You know, In this case, we did actually forget that. So I can go in and uh, where is status? Where's status item? Copy status. So yeah, we've got a lot of terminology problems here. So I wanna filter by, co or I wanna show copy status. So let's put the name. And so you can add a field just like you did before. You can change the column label, column label just like you did before. So we've added the status field. Um, and maybe we even wanna filter for status, in which case we would use the ID, add fields, we're gonna um, change the operator to enlist so that we can select the status as we want. We will also change the shelving location to enlist because I meant to do that before. So this is a way so you can just go back, edit what you did, and then save it as a new report, you know, save it as a template, uh, and then and then that's done. So that is, that's a handy way to copy someone's template that you find super useful. And then since you have your own copy of it, they can do whatever they want to. Like the original the original doesn't matter anymore. Um, so like, you know, now the risk of doing that is that maybe I found a problem with the template you thought was so cool and I moved it and you have a copy of the bad one. Well, you know, it's just one of the risks. Um, so, where do I find out more about reports? And also, oh, how do we share templates? So at the beginning, when we have the folders, um, you were creating a folder. I'll just say, uh, this is to create a subfolder. There is this option here. So you don't share a template exactly. It ha yes, exactly. It has to be in a shared folder. Uh, no, you don't have to copy a template from a shared folder. If the reason I mentioned shared folders is that let's say 
I mean, it, like the one I just did was not in a shared folder, for instance. This is not shared, and I was able to to clone it. Um, but the the reason there's there are shared folders is so you can have access to these useful things that your colleagues have created, and then you can make your own copy of it. So strategies for managing a large number of consistent templates for a consortium. Whew, you asked the hard questions. So yeah, and if you're at the very beginning of this, you're, you're at an advantage because Pines was like the wild west for years. And it still kind of is. Quick reports for us took care of a lot of it. And I'll show you quick reports in a second just so you'll see what it looks like. But um, what I do, and I know that um, uh, Don does this, our, 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 our um, circulation um, specialist Don and um, Taryn, our, our program manager, all have these sort of same methods. But what I do is I have a C-sharp shared folder that is this. And I have that shared with the consortium. And then I open, when you open that up, you'll see I have it divided into subjects. And then within each one, I'll have my set of templates. Now, all of these were created at a particular time. It does show the create time for each of your templates for a particular purpose. So you are, you know, I vouched for it on 7-7 of 2016. Whether it works now or not, I don't know. And I'm not like testing all the templates I've ever created to find out. Um, there is always a risk of breakage as the report, as the uh, database schema gets changed with every upgrade. So that's just another risk. We do now have this UI column that shows you where it was created. So it's, if it says XUL, uh, that's Zool, pronounced Zool, that is from the old staff client. If it says web staff, that means it was created in the newer staff client. That does change how it's treated by the system. So um, that, I, I would just say, just be careful about organizing them to begin with. And if you can, as you find ones that no longer work, make sure you move them out of the way so that other people aren't gonna grab bad templates. Uh, that, that's really the only advice I have for you. Okay, is it possible to add titles to report results? Um, do you mean title the report or add book titles? Yes, so when you're creating, so so the templates have a name, so those, those will be somewhere in there. But when you run a report, and we did this a second ago, I'll just run it again. I'm gonna click my simple shelving list. Well, I'll do the clone this time, since we fixed it. You, If you check more than one, it's not gonna work. You have to un, uncheck it. Uh, it does allow you to select them all if you were going to like move them all or delete them all. That's why that exists. Okay, so I'm going to click create a uh, report from select a template. Here is the title. So that's the name. Um, as far as the actual like text or in the Excel file or whatever, if that's what you're asking, that's not there. I don't see why, you know, we use a, a Perl library that inter that creates the Excel file. Um, it's, I think it's just called reportdata.xls and just sheet one, but I think you could actually name the sheet if you wanted to. I don't know. Is that what you mean? Is that helpful? I'll, um, I'll answer Diane while you're doing that. So how can I share template I created with another library in my consortium. Now, in Pines, we don't typically allow cross library system sharing. And it's possible that your consortium does the same thing. Um, and the reason for that in our case is that we, um, we know that each library system does things subtly different from another. And there's a lot of language that can be misunderstood across systems. There's a lot of 
a lot of the processes are slightly different. A lot of the assumptions are slightly different. And it just opens things up to a lot of risk uh, that, um, that we think it's better to just not allow sharing. Um, we have sometimes had a library say, we think this is a really great template. We would like to share this. And then we vet it. And if we think it's generic enough, we will share it. But we don't allow cross-system sharing, if that makes sense. So I hope that's helpful. OK, looking at Jeremy. Staff tries to do a report. New template from scratch or existing. Doesn't get the results they expected. They want to know why. How do I see the template they actually use, the choices they made when running it, and their results? OK, that is where you would ask them for the reports output URL. They can get that from here where you know we had our, our output, so we're going to view our report output. That is here. That should also be available to them in the email that they receive. So you can just say, can you share the reports output URL? Okay, and at that point you can look at the debugging info. info. Um, it actually does down in the template like it, it's hard to read what they actually did, but it is in this code, like what they actually did. But what I do is I look at the SQL. I just throw this in a file. I do those finds and replaces that I talked about and then figure out where the problem is. And at that point, you're talking about, and it sounds like, Jeremy, you might actually benefit from a like advanced kind of consortial level reports training that you know we, maybe I'll do someday. Uh, not this conference, but um, but you know, being able to get in there, understand how to control joins with the nullability feature. That's what that little um, clicker is for nullability. That allows you to control which table is joined which way. Um, you know that that's that's usually what it is. But often it's because they selected the wrong filters or something like that. Like you can see here. Oh, well, you, only, you you created an impossible situation and your report came back blank. Also, the other thing is just knowing your data and the, um, the you know, the libraries often know it better than we do at the admin level, but knowing your data really helps. Okay, let's see. Okay. When I give staff a report, I add the title on an Excel report. I'm wondering if the title telling them what they're looking at can be added without me. So, uh, Stuart, said the the in excel the tab gets the title of the report so maybe that's enough and you just need to point them to the tab um okay so an advanced seminar i i have my own personal joke that that's not super funny but i always say that there is no such thing as as a, as a non-advanced reports training in evergreen where were the filters we put on the report we just created do you mean where in the sql because they're here, um, this is this is hard to read, but this maps over to this table. So that's the org unit ID, and this text that's between these dollar signs. This is actually a quote symbol for Postgres. This is why it's better to just throw it into a um, into a text editor and do a big find and replace. Um, Okay, let me just real quick before we break um, for for good here, I, I wanted to show you the Pines Quick Reports just so you know what it is and know that this is what we want to recreate. Um, so we have, oops, I don't want admin, I want C Sharp. Okay, here we go. Oh, last pass. Why do you bug me? Okay, so we have this tool. The point of this tool was to um, increase our ability to just have an easier reports thing. Basically, with reports, it's just better to hide everything you can that you don't have to see. And that's kind of what we did here. Um, so we have a set of templates organized in the way that I told you I set up my folder basically by subject. Uh, 
we have these circulation counts. It's very similar to to doing, you know, or or, or circulation uh, reports. It's very similar to doing um, a, a report like we just did. So I'll just click create a report. It takes you into a very similar looking interface where you can put the name, the description, the filters that you want, um, recurring, all that stuff. It's just a prettier interface. It does that, and you can. Um, we have the save as draft feature that's nice. Um, so if you get you know, interrupted, you can just click save as draft and walk away, then come back and then pick up your draft. That That's not something that's available in the regular reporter. Um, we have editing, which used to not be a feature. Like this was developed at the same time they added editing. You run the report and it tells you if it's, if it's done um, there. And then you can look at the ones that I've run. You know, so I can look at this, I can run it again, I can delete it, etc. I've got, I don't have any draft reports. I don't really use these because I'm usually deep in the database. Um, the other th cool thing we have is this executive snapshot where we have this, these are pre-run, so the data is already there and we just filter it live. So like if I pick a, you know, this is the Augusta Regional Library main branch, I've got last month's report, I can click on these different things, you know, users who place holes, the amount of builds, this is random, total items, value of items, run report, and then automatically I'm just thrown into a screen that has all of these done. So what, what we did is not that hard to do, um, we just, that, that code is open source, you can see, um, how it's done it's on the evergreen site uh the git site i'll just i'll share that for any tech people like jeremy that are interested uh let me get there pines um report creator .git. this is where it lives so it requires some php um stuff that's not normally in evergreen and that's that's one of the reasons i think there's been a low adoption rate is that a lot of people just don't love php and you can count me among them i'm not a huge fan but um but this this feature is awesome and i've I, you know our libraries love this uh especially because it has this executive reports feature so the thing where you're like oh my god when is it gonna you know the reports in, you know the board meetings in 10 minutes and i have to have the report well you know this is a solution to that you know, just ready to roll, it's already been run, there's nothing to do. So that's executive reports versus quick reports, but both of them are in that same Git branch. Okay, any questions about reports or comments or anything that maybe I said I was gonna cover that I did not, there's always something I drop. Okay, so Keith, uh, you we should talk offline. Um, Emerald Data Networks, uh, created and continues to maintain this for us. Um, we we really want this to be just part of core Evergreen. Oh, transforms. Um, let me get back to that in two seconds. We want this. We want something like this to live in core Evergreen. And actually, um, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative is talking to Equinox about a dashboard type. Fun, uh, feature that will have similar functions to this, um, and so that you know that that's that's something that you know if I know the Pines libraries would want at least the executive snapshot to work in the in the dashboard, but you know that's something like that. That's th that that's in the works, and I mean n nobody's developing it yet, but it's in the specifications phase. So just know that that's that's there. Um, and if you're interested in it, um, setting up and administering quick reports for your library system, um, you can talk to me offline or um, you can talk to Adam Bowling, who is probably somewhere, I don't know if he's here today, um, with, em with Emerald Data Networks, and he can, he can give you more information about helping you set it up from their, their point of view. Um, so I guess that's it. Okay, let me talk about transforms really fast. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to that before. The best way to demonstrate a transform, I'm gonna clone my clone, and I am going to add a date range. 
So um, this is our same, same list that we had before. I'm here down here with the filters. Um, I am going to remove the copy status filter by clicking remove field. And then I'm going to go to item and click on the word item. And I'm going to click uh, creation date time. And then I'm going to add the field. Now, by default, this data is stored as a timestamp. And if you want to have a date range, a timestamp isn't great. So it's better to change this from timestamp to date. And that's when you use a transform. You transform that information from one thing to another. So the raw data is a timestamp. And you have all of these different possibilities. Oh, that's interesting. I've This is because I blew it up so big that it's doing this weird thing. <laughs> anyway, um, I pretty much just use date or year plus month for certain monthly things. Um, but date, and then if you change that to the operator from equals to between, what it will do is create, I'm gonna save now. What it will do is it will create a date field when you're running the report. So I'm gonna go back down to my clone clone and I am going to click create new report. Okay, so now you've got this real date, real date function. So I can say between X and Y, and then that gives you items created during that period. And that that's because we chose date. We changed that to date rather than just keeping it as timestamp, which is timestamp is the date plus the time plus like this long second thing plus the time zone. So that's not useful for this sort of thing. So it is is um, done here. By the way, I'll mention that real date versus relative date. So the relative date is going to be X days ago or months ago or whatever you've picked. You know, so it created between one day ago and 17 days ago or 17 days ago and one day ago. That used to matter, the order between these two. We now have a feature in place that makes it so it doesn't matter. It used to be that if you had this reversed, it would not return any results because Postgres was dumb. But with a new feature called, um, oh gosh, I forgot what the term is. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You can now pick it in any order and that'll do it. Okay, so quick reports would be helpful. Sage implemented quick reports, right. The, the developer who implemented that is no longer there. Okay, any other questions, comments, uh, needs? Okay, so further documentation and what do I do from here? Start with this um, section that we did. Uh, we didn't get into some of the stuff that's on here. So if you have any questions after the fact, just let me know. Uh, we've got all these Pines reports descriptions. Now that you know how I do documentation, you will see what these are and you can create these for yourself. Some of those like class item list, that is a Pines view. So it's possible that's not enabled where you are, but um, hopefully these can serve as examples. Um, and the other things I'll show you, the evergreen, the docs.evergreen.ils.org section on reports is very good. That's gotten better and better throughout. Let's see, do we have recent? You know, let's see. Okay, yeah, so now this is the Antora stuff. So you can expand reports, the report section, and that will get you there. I'll share share this link if nobody else does. In here, boom, boom. Okay, I don't know if any of our members are using it. Oh, oh, it's Sage. Okay, um, and then this this goes through a lot of the stuff that we just talked about. Um, so I would say if you're an admin and have to troubleshoot reports, you really have to know SQL to do this. Um, and you know we can follow up with uh, on the IRC channel at Evergreen um, or over email or whatever. Uh, and we can we can talk about whatever you want to talk about, uh, advanced topics.
Yes, talk talk to Andrea. She will. Um, she's helping. She's their um, uh, development project manager, and she can field questions about that. Or you know, she might. There may be some features that Equinox hasn't um, hasn't considered yet that might be useful. So, yeah, let it, let everybody know. Okay, I really appreciate everybody's time today. We ran over a little bit, but uh, I think this was a worthwhile session, and I will see y'all later in the conference. Oh, and you we, see the dog? You see my doggies back here. <laughs> and we thank you, Chris. It was wonderful. I'm always happy to do it. And thanks again to our sponsors. Have a lovely afternoon and evening, everyone. We get started again tomorrow morning with the welcoming keynote at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll see you there. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, all.